Yep. So if you want to move data to the cloud, if you want to move data to the cloud for processing, for archiving, if you want to reduce spending money on capital, buying storage, or you want to replicate data to the cloud for protection and recovery, then you've come to the right session. My name is Paul Reed. I'm a product manager at AWS. I work out of our Boston office. I'm going to be joined on stage today by Jeff Bartley, one of my colleagues, a solution architect, and two of our customers using DataSync to help move data to AWS. We've got a packed agenda. I'm going to give you a brief intro to the service. Some of you may know the service. Some of you may not, so I'll give you a very brief intro into the service. We'll talk about some of the things we've done since we launched last year at reInvent. I'll then introduce Magnus, who's going to come on stage and talk about what Millennium Management are doing with DataSync. We're then going to do a live demo. Jeff and I are going to tag team on that. And then I'm going to introduce Maya from Walt Disney Imagineering, who's going to come on stage, talk about their experience with DataSync, and then we'll close it up, and we can take Q&A at the end. So as more and more critical workloads move to the cloud, workloads rely on data. For anybody that sat through Andy's keynotes, data was at the heart of a lot of those services that he talked about today. And as more of those workloads move to AWS, you've got to move the data that supports those workloads. Those data sets are becoming increasingly large. So what use cases do we see customers wanting to move data to the cloud? What kind of workloads are you guys bringing to the cloud? First one is just pure application migration. You're moving applications. You want to lift and shift an application. You need to move the data ahead of moving the application. Maybe you're just replatforming it to the cloud in the first case. So you want to bring it into either S3 as our object store or into one of our uh, fully managed file system offerings. Second use case we see is this idea of processing. Again, that was talked about a lot in the keynote this morning, where you're moving data to the cloud for the purposes of processing. Maybe you've got um, a, media, a media rendering workload, or perhaps you're producing um, genomic sequences on sequences in a wet lab, and you need to move those to the cloud for processing. Third use case is just freeing up storage capacity. You have a lot of data that's cold data that's sat around on really expensive on-premises storage in your data centers. You could bring that data to the cloud for low-cost storage in some of our storage uh, classes in S3, for example, free up that on-prem capacity to avoid having to expand that on-prem footprint, buy more storage. And lastly, you have data that you care about. It's valuable to your business. It's the lifeblood of your business in many cases, and you want to be able to protect that data. A good place to put that again is moving it to the cloud. Again, the data may still reside on-prem. You may master it on-premises for now. But putting it in the cloud is a great first step to moving to the cloud so you can put it there for recovery and disaster, uh, recovery and protection purposes. So what do you do today? I mean, the problem is pretty simple, right? Everybody's, everybody's moved a little data around, right? The problem becomes when you start trying to do this at scale. You start trying to worry about all of the things that you need to do to move large quantities, hundreds of millions of files, hundreds of millions of terabytes, petabytes, to the cloud. There's a lot to think about. What protocol are you going to use? How does it tra traverse the network? What no network does it traverse? Do you have enough capacity to compute? Something has to do the data transfer. It doesn't just move on its own. So do you have enough compute on both ends to manage this transfer? Are you going to compress the data? Is it even compressible? If it's file system data, what about all that metadata that comes along with it? Permissions, access controls, timestamps, things that certainly if you're building an archive are kind of important to keep. Are you going to scale out? Are you going to scale up? How are you going to manage that? How are you going to secure this data, especially if that data is important from maybe it's HIPAA data or PII data? How are you going to secure that data to keep your auditors happy that you're doing the right things with that really important piece of sets of data? Most importantly, once that data goes from your premises to the cloud, how are you going to make sure the data on the far end is what started out at the beginning? How are you going to do that data validation to make sure that you haven't lost anything and that your data hasn't been changed along the way. These are hard problems to solve at scale. Easy, easy for individual files, but hard at scale. One customer that we talked to, um, uh, this was last year actually before we launched the service, spent around about $30,000 just to do that data validation piece. In this instance, they were, they were a medical device manufacturer. So for them, this was medical records. So they had to ensure that every bit that left their on-premises filer arrived in the cloud unchanged. That's a lot of money to spend just on checksumming data, right? 
So we built and launched DataSync last year to simplify, automate, and accelerate online data transfer between your premises and AWS. If you want to bring data back to your premises, we do that too. It's not a one-way door. The majority of our customers have been using it for inbound, but we have customers that have workloads that span both locations, and so this ability to move transparently or seamlessly between both is super important. This is going to become a bit of an eye chart. What does a service encapsulate? I talked about all of the problems and some of the things you need to think about when you're building your own DIY solution. We built DataSync to be fast. First and foremost, if you've got a lot of data, petabytes of data, you need to move data quickly over the network. DataSync will move data at about 10 gigabits a second. If you're storage people, you want to think about that as how much storage. That's about 100 terabytes a day that the service will happily move for you. We manage scale out for you. We parallelize, tra parallelize transfer. That's a hard one to say. Uh, we parallelize transfer. We do compression in line. We do incrementals. So if you're constantly moving a data set that's active, we're only going to move the changes. We're not going to keep copying data that's unchanged and wasting your network. We've made this easy to use. There's nothing in the cloud to worry about. It is a service. So you don't have to worry about building or scaling or managing any infrastructure in the cloud. We've added things like filtering to enable you to select the data that you want to move, schedule periodic transfers, and bandwidth limits. Again, the service in many cases, a lot of customers are saying, you're, you're, you're taking up too much of my network, slow down, slow down. So we've added bandwidth filters into the service. Security again, job number one at AWS. Your data is secured in transit. We encry encrypt by default. We do end-to-end -end validation by default. We recover from IO failures. Networks still fail. We take care of that under the covers. You don't see any of that. We just move your data. You ask us to move it, we'll move it for you. We're integrated with the rest of the platform services within AWS, integrated with S3 and EFS on the storage side. We've done a lot of work with those service teams to make sure that we can get data into or take data out of those services as quickly as, as is possible. And we're integrated with things like CloudWatch, CloudTrail, and the usual services that you're used to from, from managing access, management, monitoring, maintenance, and those sorts of things. We have a whole set of compliances, again, for those workloads that demand, um, demand things like PCI, HIPAA, SOC, and FIPS. And lastly, the service, we want it to be simple. We want it to be cost effective. We have a simple pricing model. You pay for every gigabyte you move, or fraction thereof. No minimums, very predictable. You know how much data you want to move. It's very easy to calculate how much it's going to cost you. So how does the service work? In this example, I want to move from a shared file system on premises to maybe Amazon S3 or EFS. First thing you're going to do is you're going to deploy an agent on premises that's going to attach to your storage using NFS or SMB. We want to keep those protocols on the LAN. They're really LAN protocols. They're not built for moving data over long distances. It's super inefficient. NFS is clear text. It's not secure. A whole bunch of reasons that you don't want to run those protocols over the wide area network. That agent deploys as a VM in your data center. It's downloadable from the AWS console. That agent then connects using a TLS 1.2 um, protocol that we've built, um, highly parallelized, highly uh, optimized for sending over the wide area network to our service endpoints in AWS. We have public endpoints. We have VPC endpoints and FIPS endpoints, depending on what your needs are. That service is scalable. It's elastic. It scales for you, depending on how much data it's receiving from your on-premises agent. And it's optimized to push data into Amazon S3 and DFS on the back end. And when you see the demo, you'll see that all of this is, you just manage this all through the console or the API. So that was the service that we launched last year. What have we done for you since then? So we added file and folder filtering. Again, a lot of this was asks that we had in the first few months or the, or the last 12 months, I guess, of, of the service running. So file and folder filtering allows you to select files so you can exclude and include files. And we'll see an example of that in the demo in a moment. We've added an AMI. Now, this allows you to deploy that agent in cloud now. So it doesn't just have to live on premises. It allows you to move data between, say, AWS regions. We've added those FIPS and VPC endpoints. Again, a lot of customers using Direct Connect don't have access to public endpoints um, over their Direct Connect, but they want to move that data at high speed over their Direct Connect. And so the VPC endpoints allow them to drop that data into a private subnet and still get to the service. We added CloudWatch dashboards. Again, we're moving all this data around. You guys want visibility as to what we're moving, so we've added inline CloudWatch dashboards into our console. So when you come to the DataSync console, you'll see graphs showing you the data as it's moving and how fast it's moving, where it's moving from and to. And we added S3 storage class support, super important for customers doing archival or um, backup 
where you don't necessarily want to go into S3 standard, you want to move in, say, Glacier or Glacier, even Glacier Deep Archive directly. You don't want to put it in and lifecycle it, just put it in that low cost S3 storage out the gate. On the 20th of November, we had a, a big event storage day where we did a lot of our storage announcements ahead of reInvent. Um, one of the things we announced then was task queuing and scheduling. So this allows you to have a task that's going to periodically move your data from maybe on-prem to, to S3. So if you were having an archive, you had, say, an RPO of 24 hours, you could schedule a task to run once a day, and it'll copy any changes from on-premises into your S3 bucket. Service was in 15 regions. We added another five, so we're now in all commercial regions, excluding the two China regions. That includes both GovCloud regions. And we also reduced the price. So I mentioned that it's predictable pricing, so the price of the service now is 1.25 cents per gigabyte, or some amount of dollars, depending on how you want to read it. Um, so again, super easy to know. You know how much data you want to move, so it's super easy to calculate how much it's going to cost you to move that data. So with that brief intro to the service, I'm going to hand over to Magnus, um, who's going to talk to you about his experience over the last uh, year using DataSync since we launched. All right, thank you. Thanks, Magnus. Hello. So I'm Magnus, and I'm with uh, Millennium Management. Uh, we are a global investment management firm with offices all around the world. Um, we are about 3,000 people and been around for about 25 years. So um, I want to share some of the experience we had uh, uh, as of date to using DataSync. Um, so uh, OK, that was the intro. <laughs> so we have a, a ton of data. We just have um, a lot of data. Uh, everywhere, and some of the data we have on NFS filers uh, sitting on premise. We want to make sure that all of that data is you know, available if we have some sort of disaster um, on premise. We want to make sure we have it available off premise. Uh, we also have uh, compliance requirements as well, uh, so have that available up to, up to seven years, right? So we want to take snapshots of this uh, fairly frequently, uh, about at least once a week. Um, and then uh, with that, we want to be able to restore individual files or, or complete file systems if we have to. And we want to do this uh, at a very large scale, right? So we're talking about petabytes of data. Uh, we're talking about billions uh, of files. Uh, seven years is a long time, though. So we want to make sure that if we do you know, put this, all this data in one place, uh, that we have the capability you know, to get it out and, and put it somewhere else. We, we want to avoid that, you know, that lock-in, right? Um, and also, if you do move all of that data into the cloud, it would be great if you can actually make use of it, you know, be able to access it and, and apply it to some, uh, to some other uses as well, right? Um, so we looked at uh, three main categories of, of different solutions out there. Uh, we looked at the kind of the traditional tape, uh, virtual tape um, solutions, and we kind of discounted them pretty quickly. <laughs> There's a lot of things we actually want to get away from. Um, uh, we're looking then at kind of two categories of a little bit more uh, modern, a little bit more cloud-native solutions. Um, uh, one is kind of block-level replication, where you essentially detect that change uh, on the block on-premise, and then that gets replicated up. Then you have software on top of that that figures out, okay, what blocks becomes a file or a file system, uh, keeps track of the different snapshots and stuff like that. It all uh, pretty great solutions, um, but they have two kind of big issues. One, it doesn't get to the scale. Uh, that we want to get to. Um, and also, there's a, somewhat of a lock-in. You know, it's pretty easy to get the data in there, but it's fairly hard to kind of pull that out and, and then put that somewhere else. Right. Uh, then we have the file-level replication, which is you know, including data sync, which just takes a change um, in the file on-premise and then makes, you know, copies that, replicates that over into the cloud. And then it meets what we have in, in all the previous slides if we add in versioning uh, to that object store as well. So if you use data sync, we have to uh, turn on S3 versioning as well uh, to make that work. Um, and, and that works pretty well. It's, it's, it's obviously not as kind of efficient when it comes to like the bits and bytes as block level. Um, so that's kind of a negative, but they're much better at uh, combining that with moving uh, things into different storage classes. So we can easily move uh, those things into, to, into Glacier or into Deep Archive and it makes it quite cost efficient as well. So that's what we decided to do. We're going to use data sync. We're going to use it with S3 versioning. So how, you know, how do we now get there uh, from having nothing to 
um, have it up and running and kind of weekly doing these recurring syncs. Uh, and we started pretty early. We actually started earlier than uh, data sync was really ready for us. So we started by ordering uh, a whole bunch of snowballs, starting loading data onto those snowballs, sent them up, and, and, and put that into S3. One important point, which is a, a good lesson learned, is that um, we didn't have the metadata available to us. We didn't have the requirements for it. It was a little bit too early. Uh, so you had to send up all this data without all the metadata. The data sync uses to kind of keep track of uh, keep track of all the uh, all the files and all the information. Uh, so that was kind of part of that. And later we'll see what that means. Um, then at the same time, we're starting to build out all the infrastructure uh, that we needed to do these things, right? So we put in um, hardware on premise where we're going to run all the agents. We also provisioned. Uh, uh, a direct connect, we're gonna uh, do all the transfers across um, and kind of have that, that whole uh, piece there, right? And as we built that out, we very quickly realized that with, with the scale that we were doing all this with, um, all the complexities that came along with it, uh, we definitely need to automate all of this. Um, the APIs that are there are, are good, they do, they're not that complicated, but at this scale, uh, we really had to build something that was kind of fit for purpose for what, what we tried to do. So, so we kind of built a management logic on top of that as well. And in the next slide, I will go into some detail of that as well. Um, so now, now we're actually ready to um, do this first sync. And we run this first sync. And if you remember, I mentioned metadata. Um, what happens when we do the, the sync, data sync is great. It figures out you know, what's there, what's not there, just sending up the delta. But because we didn't have the metadata, uh, it needed to add all that metadata in too, right? So we had it all there sitting uh, with the metadata going forward. Um, uh, the problem with S3 versioning when you do that, though, is that metadata cannot be inline updated. It essentially has to be another copy put to it. So as part of this process, we essentially doubled all the storage. I and mean, we're talking petabyte scale storage, that's not really the place we want to end up. Um, so we had to, um, to build an additional piece of software that essentially went through all of that and cleaned all of that up for us, right? So that's a, a, a good lesson to share with all of you. Um, all right, but now we have everything up there, everything is sitting in a good state, uh, and now we can start adding in some logic to our software the schedules everything, uh, put in alerts and stuff like that. And with this in place, we can now start doing uh, recurring things. Uh, we cannot forget, though, that uh, we also need uh, to be able to restore, right? Individual files is actually quite easy. Uh, we can use the CLI, uh, we can use the SDK, we can just you know, ask for the files to be uh, sent to us, right? So that's, that's quite easy. Uh, the good thing with the data sync as well is that we can actually reverse the process. So if we wanted to get a file system back, uh, we can actually just reverse data sync and off we go. Right. All right, so uh, digging into a little bit of that box I had for, for that management of this. Um, so one of the key things that we decided first we, was that we're going to create some DynamoDB tables where we're actually going to store the long-term information about all our backup jobs. Um, so, you know, the source, the targets, what schedule we're going to run them on, all kind of, kind of information that we want to keep track of them. And then we have uh, some uh, scripts. We essentially have flat files. We can load them, and they will uh, update these tables, either new things or things that need to be updated. Uh, we capture all those things through DynamoDB streams. Um, we have a Lambda functions that, that detects all of these things and then check with what's in data sync to see, okay, is what we want to have there, is that actually there? Um, and one of the things um, that this does is that in, is, there's certain things in data sync you can not actually update just uh, with a single command or in line. Uh, a, a great example is agents, for example. Agents are kind of pinned to locations, which de defines where things are, uh, which is then kind of put together with tasks. So if we want to change agents and what agents to use, we essentially have to tear everything down and build everything back up. Right? And this uh, function kind of just automates all that for us uh, and kind of keeps everything in the state that we want to have it. Right? All right, so we have, all, we have the tables. We're tracking all the information. We have everything now in data sync uh, where we kind of want to have it. Um, uh, we now can start 
uh, actually kicking things off, right? So um, we have a Lambda function that runs every five minutes, um, and um, it, it checks, you know, what, you know, what's the schedule of jobs, is what things are supposed to run. Uh, it also checks the state of the agent to see, okay, what agents are actually available, and then uh, matches that up and, and, and kicks things off. The thing it does in addition to that, which I think is kind of a key thing to, to make this work at scale, is to uh, detect what agents are actually not busy, what agents are actually having no, no queue of jobs coming to them, have nothing going on for them, and then start reassigning the different uh, jobs to those. So if you have a stable of agents, make sure you utilize them all the time and kind of reassign, reassign things and, and do some resource management across that. Um, we also do some detection of things that might not go as we expect, things taking longer, is there more data there, uh, and then send alerts uh, to, to us to, to, to alert us so that, and we can take some action on that as well. Uh, we are listening to anything coming out of DataSync, all the different events. We make sure we keep track of those, uh, any timings, uh, what number of files that are, that are happening, and any of those things. Uh, so we later on uh, can uh, produce reports to this, right? So we want to see what happened with the last run. Uh, we also might want to see what happens over time, right? Are we sending more data? Are things taking longer? Are things taking quicker? You know, what, what, what happens, right? We built a lot of this before some of the uh, latest features came out. So some of these things are uh, there now in the service, which is great, and other things uh, we are hoping would come sometime in the future. Um, all right, so we have all of that set up. We have all these files. We have all the management software. So talk a little about scale and timing, right? So for us, like I mentioned, we have petabytes of data that we're doing this with. We have billions of files. Uh, on a weekly basis, we don't have more than, it's gonna be less than 10% of files are changing, right? So we don't have a wholesale change of everything. Uh, we run these of 17 agents, uh, 64 gig uh, of RAM for each one of them. Um, and we have, like I mentioned before, we have a dedicated connection, a 10 uh, gig uh, connection, uh, where we do all the transfers across, right? And doing this, it's, it's never taking us more than four days uh, uh, to run this, right? Um, it usually actually takes two and a half to three days, so it'll be quicker than that, but it's never taking more than four days to run this. Um, and again, this is for, you know, this is for kind of the ongoing sync uh, as, as we go on, go on right? This, for the initial one, it definitely would take longer if you have a lot of data. Um, so, all right. Last slide before I hand it back to Jeff and Paul. So some of the lessons learned as we, as we go through this. Um, there's a number of different phases that DataSync goes through. The a couple of main ones are the preparation and the transfer phase. Um, the one uh, that is actually the most intense one is the preparation phase, which is essentially where DataSync figures out what are the files that actually has changed. It actually does a scan of everything, right? Uh, that's really what um, is, is doing really well, but also um, uh, what you're gonna realize later is that that's really what you're gonna optimize against. You will need to make sure that that works really well. If that works well, these things are gonna work well. Um, like I mentioned before, we have, to have a dedicated network. It's super easy to exhaust, exhaust the pipe uh, at this scale. It, it happens very quickly. Uh, another thing that was a big surprise for us uh, was that for some of, the, uh, some of the data, we have them on spinning disk, and we were, we were worried that this would really be a big bottleneck, right? Um, but for the, again, the, 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 you know, the preparation being the most intensive part, uh, the way it does that, it's mostly doing statting, and that could actually fit in the cache. So uh, it actually worked really well. We haven't seen any problems with that. So um, um, uh, if you have that, I think it's gonna work. Uh, I mentioned the automated way to move things between agents. I think that's, that's super important. Uh, you really can get things kind of bunched up and bundled up if you have an unexpected long uh, sync going for a particular file system. Um, yeah, the other thing is that at this scale, really test on small, <laughs> small things first. Um, it's hard to, to back something out. If you run, it's very easy to run this on a large scale, and if, that, if you do that wrong, if you have misconfigured something, it's gonna take you a long time to kind of get out of that, right? Um, when we're talking about the metadata and doing that, uh, you know, outside of data sync, I'm actually not 
discouraging from doing that. I think that's a very viable way to, to get a large amount of data up. Just make sure you have the metadata. Just look at what the metadata is supposed to look like, uh, and, and that will work. But that, you know, that's, I can't stress that enough. Uh, another thing that we did, uh, and that Paul mentioned about the storage classes, was that we were initially thinking that we're going to use uh, lifecycle rules to move the data between different storage classes, and we uh, quickly realized that that's not viable, actually. Um, when we, when we, at least for our use case, uh, we have a lot of files, and a lot of files are actually small as well, and uh, lifecycle rules cannot be filtered on size. Uh, it's not one, one thing that's part of the filter, right? And it's not very cost efficient to put a lot of very small files into, into Glacier or into Deep Archive. The good thing here is that DataSync does actually look at size when it moves things into store classes. So uh, one recommend, recommended way here is do that as you actually move it in, right? And let uh, DataSync uh, take care of that part of it. So, All right, let me hand back to um, Paul and Jeff. Thanks, Magnus. All right, well, thanks everyone. So thank you, Magnus. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, walk through a quick live demo. I'm gonna do a demo, I'm gonna launch a few tasks. I'm gonna hand it back to Paul, he'll talk a little bit and we'll go back and forth as we go through our demo. So our demo scenario today is that we've got an NFS server on premises and we've got some data on there that we wanna move into the cloud. Some of that data is really cold data, it's in a folder conveniently called cold data. And we want to move that data into S3 Glacier Deep Archive. It's not something that's being accessed very often. We want to put it into low cost storage, um, but we need to hold on to it. We want to get it into the cloud. So that's going to go into our S3 bucket. And we've got another folder called miscellaneous data. And some of that data we want to also get up into the cloud, but we want to put it into EFS because we've got some processing up in the cloud that we want to go through with that data. But not all of the data in that folder needs to head up into the cloud. So we're going to show you how to use filters to kind of filter out what data needs to be transferred and what doesn't. Now, to, to implement this demo, what I did was I, I deployed a few resources into uh, my cloud environment. So I've, in my on-premises environment, which is uh, the Northern California region, I deployed an EC2 instance, which is acting as my NFS file server. And then I deployed two data sync agents. So you, as, as Magnus referred to, you can have a pool of agents. So we're going to show you how you can take advantage of that. And those are also deployed as EC2 instances. And then in my destination region is uh, US East 2, or the Ohio region. And I've deployed an S3 bucket there, as well as an EFS file system. So with that, I'll switch over and uh, go to the uh, AWS Management Console. So you can see that I've already got my agents uh, deployed and activated in the data sync environment here. So I've got two agents. Uh, these are uh, both using a public service endpoint. We actually offer three types of endpoints. This is how the agents connect to the managed AWS data sync service that's running in my destination region, in this case, Ohio. Uh, those three options are either a public endpoint, uh, a FIPS compliant endpoint, or a private endpoint. So for customers who need to ensure that all of their data is going through, let's say, a, 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 a VPN or a uh, direct connect connection, you can use a private link connection for that. I chose public just for ease of demo today. Um, I'm gonna jump over to my NFS server real quick, and I'll just run the show mount command just to show you what I've got. I've got one export on there, that's slash media slash data. And if I go to that directory, You can see that I've got my two folders in there, cold data and miscellaneous data. And if we look in the cold data directory, we've got 200 JPEG files. These are the files that I want to move into S3 Glacier Deep Archive. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to the console, and I'm going to go ahead and create a task. And that's how you actually do the movement of data using data sync. So I'm going to go ahead and create my task. And when you create a task, you have a source location and you have a destination location. You're going to, copy all, you're going to always copy data from the source to the destination. Um, so I'm going to create a new source location, and I'm copying from my NFS file system. So I'm going to select NFS as my location type. Um, I'm, I can choose from the agents that I want to use. I could do one or two, or I could do both if I wanted. I'm going to go ahead and select agent one. And then I'm going to specify the uh, IP address or domain name of my NFS server which I've got in my CloudFormation stack when I deployed my resources. 
and I'm going to drop that in there. And then I'm going to give it the mount path. So the agent is actually going to mount the NFS server. And so I'm, I'm going to remember it was media slash data. And then I'm going to tell it where I want to actually get the data from, which is cold data. Okay. So we'll hit next. And then I'm going to create my destination location, which is my S3 bucket. So I'm going to select S3, and I've got my S3 bucket that I deployed. It's empty right now. There's nothing in it. You see it's NFS to S3 and then a unique ID there, which I just created just to make sure it was globally unique. So I'll search for it here. There's my bucket. And then I select the storage class. So this is the storage class when the data sync agent or the services is putting the data into the S3 bucket. This is the storage class we want to use. Again, I want to put it into Glacier Deep Archive. I want to maximize my cost savings. I'm not going to be accessing this data very often. And data sync gives me a quick message, tells me about the fact that, hey, you know, if you've got small objects in there, there are things you want to consider. Paul's going to talk a little bit about that um, when I pass it back over to him. And then I want to put it at the root level of my bucket. So I'm just going to put slash in there. And then the data sync service actually has to talk to the bucket. So it has to have an IAM role to actually access that bucket. I've gone ahead and created one uh, as part of my deployment. So I'm going to select that role. I could also have the data sync uh, service auto generate one for me if I didn't have one pre-created, but I did. So I'm just going to go ahead and use that. I'll click next. And I'm going to give my task a name. We'll call it, call it copy cold data. And then I have a bunch of options associated with my task. I can control how I want to verify my data as I'm copying it. I can control how I want to copy file metadata. So Magnus talked about metadata, uh, copying ownership and permissions and timestamps and things like that. Uh, we have options around how you want to handle deleted files. So if a file is deleted on the source, do I also want to delete it on the destination or not? The, the default is that it will not delete files on the destination if they're deleted on the source. Uh, it's also giving an option around overwriting files. So if a file changes on the source, do I also want to change it on the destination? Sometimes you may not want to. By default, it will overwrite the files. It'll keep those two in sync for you. Um, Magnus talked about uh, setting bandwidth limits. So you know, if you've got a 10 gig pipe, data sync will possibly, depending upon the, the data that you're moving, use all of that 10 gig pipe. And you may not, that may not be uh, what you want. So you can actually set a bandwidth limit here in megabytes per second if that's what you'd like to do. I'm just going to say use available. And then we have the option to also queue tasks. So if you're running multiple tasks on the same agent, uh, an agent can only execute one task at a time. But if you uh, create multiple tasks on that same agent, it can queue them up and then execute them in order. Uh, I'm not going to do any filters with this particular one. I'll do that with the next uh, task that I create. Uh, we just added scheduling, so I could schedule this task to run at a later time if I wanted to, but I want it to run right away. I could add some tags, and then I can do uh, task logging to a CloudWatch log group, which I've already gone and created. So I'm going to go ahead and click Next and just do a quick review of, uh, of what my task looks like. So I'm going to be copying my source location is NFS. I've got the right path in there using my agents. I've got my destination location is my S3 bucket. And then the options that I set, everything looks good. So I'm going to go ahead and, and click Create Task. And so it's going to take a few seconds there to create the task. Uh, you can see everything down here below uh, the task that we just created. And then it created right away. And so I'm going to go ahead and click Start to start my task. Now, when I, every time I run a task, because I can run a task multiple times, um, I get the option to change some of the options that I had set when I had originally created the task. I don't want to modify those. I'm going to use the ones that I set. So I'm going to go ahead and click Start. And that's going to start, kick off a, an execution of the task. So there's execution details. So you can see the task is launching. And with that, I'll go ahead and kick it back to Paul. And We'll talk about how data sync is optimized for S3. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so in this task, we're moving data into S3. And we talked a little bit earlier about some of the challenges you might have in moving data at scale into S3. And how, while you could do this with a DIY solution, we've baked all that into, into data sync. We've baked the best practices from S3 that are publicly known. We've worked through some of the kinks that we've had on how to scale out, how to scale up, and how to move data at speed into S3. First thing I want to point out is the data sync service is going to access your bucket using that private VPC endpoint by default. So we're not accessing the public endpoint for the bucket. 
Again, super important for anybody that cares about the security of their data to know where it's going and how it's getting into your bucket. And we're going to use that IAM role that you've vended to us or you've allowed us to auto-generate on your behalf, but it's an IAM role that lives in your account to access your bucket. So this is all visible to you. It's all controllable or managed by you. We take care of things like multi-part. We take care of parallelization. We take care of things like exponential backoff. Again, we can push data into S3 faster than they can handle it. We, we do the exponential backoff, and we don't just use the defaults in the SDK. Again, we've worked with the S3 team to, to produce a more optimal way of doing that. Um, parallelization, retries, all of that is baked into the service. We do MD5 puts all the time, so we calculate the checksums for you before we're putting the data in there. Again, you could do all of this yourself, but you'd have to script it and write code. We just take care of it for you within the service. Um, We recently launched direct put to all S3 storage classes, all six. Again, um, Jeff in this example here is going into Glacier Deep Archive. This was a, a big ask from customers wanting to just use that um, new storage class that we, that we launched earlier this year, or maybe at reInvent, I forget, um, of moving data directly into those storage classes. But that's not necessarily an easy thing to do, as Jeff was mentioning on the console, right? So first in the console, you select your storage class. An example here, you can do it command line as well for anybody that really loves doing command line. It's just an option on the command line when you're setting up the location, just as it was an option in the console when you were setting up the S3 location. Jeff mentioned about small objects. So again, for anybody that's um, aware of how S3 prices, there are certain pricing considerations you need to um, think about when you're using some of these storage classes. The first one is small object. There's a minimum object capacity when you go into storage classes such as our infrequent access storage classes or Glacier or Glacier Deep Archive. So it's super inefficient to put small objects into those storage classes. They just weren't built for that. And so rather than having that, that roundup that S3 are going to charge you, DataSync looks at the size of the object that we're transferring, and if it's smaller than that minimum, we just put it straight into standard. So for example, directories, which are slash delimited objects, are zero bytes. If I put it into Glacier, you're going to get charged 40K for that zero-byte object. So we put it into standard for you. And we'll show you that when this task finishes. Similarly, we mentioned additional options. So again, those storage classes come with other pricing considerations on things like overwrites or early deletions, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, and obviously, I can't read the files back if I'm putting them directly into Glacier. Now again, we've optimized how we can still do checksumming and still do verification on the back end using MD5 puts, and we have the objects in memory, so we can do an MD5 in memory. So we don't need to read the object back from Glacier after we've put it there. So we, don't, we can still do full end-to-end -end verification without needing to do that. And again, we give you control over overwrites to, in order to manage around some of those early deletion charges that those other storage classes like Infrequent Access and Glacier um, have within their pricing models. So again, you choose the controllers in your, uh, your hands, really, when you set up the task. You know your data, so you're the best ones to determine how you want to manage around these controls. Again, this is just how S3 works. If you were writing it yourself, you'd have to manage around those things as well. DataSync doesn't do anything smart other than put the controls in your hands through your location setup as to how you want to work with those, um, that pricing model. Okay, so I'm going to switch back over. You can see that our execution status here was success. So our task is run successfully. It moved 200 files plus an extra file that has some data sync metadata associated with it. About 11.2 megabytes were transferred. If I go up to my S3 bucket and I do a refresh on that bucket, you can see here that, in fact, if you remember what Paul was talking about, about the size of the objects, you can see that objects that are greater than 40 kilobytes ended up in the, S in the Glacier Deep Archive class, while those that were actually smaller than 40 kilobytes ended up in S3 standard. Again, we do that to cost optimize for you. Um, okay, so our, our cold data has been sex successfully copied up into our S3 bucket. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a new task that's going to copy our miscellaneous data. And let me just show you what we've got here in our miscellaneous data folder. So I've got not only some JPEG files, those are the ones that I want to copy. I've also got some files called that end in .temp. I don't want to copy those. I've also got a .snapshot directory, which is common in you know, some of your file systems where you're taking snapshots. You don't want to copy that data up either. So I'm going to show you how to use exclude filters to ignore that data and only copy the data that you want. So I'm going to go back to the console. I'm going to create a new task. Um, I'm going to, again, I'm going to copy from NFS, but I need to create a new location because I'm copying from a different directory. I'm going to go ahead, and this time I'm going to use both agents. 
And again, I'm going to use the same IP address that I used before. It's coming from the same NFS server, but my location is going to be different. I'm still coming from my media data, but this time I'm copying from miscellaneous data folder. Go ahead and click Next. Uh, this time I'm going to an EFS file system, and I've already got one pre-created, so I'll select that file system. And my, uh, where I'm going to mount it is I'm going to copy into the miscellaneous data directory on my EFS file system. So I'll click Next. Again, I'm going to say copy, uh, copy miscellaneous data. And again, same options. Uh, but this time I want to add some filtering. So the first thing I want to do is I want to say ignore my snapshot folder. And then I'm going to add another pattern to say also ignore any files that end in .temp. Okay, so I've got two patterns in there for it to ignore. Again, I'm not going to use scheduling. I could use that if I wanted to. Set my logging. Click Next. I'll check my settings. You can see this time I'm going to use both agents to copy my data. And my destination location is EFS. Everything looks good. I've got my filters in here. I'm going to go ahead and click Create Task. And while that's creating, I'll just show you I've got a second uh, client that's mounted my EFS file system. Whoops. Let me grab in there. And so you can see this is my file system here. And so if I go to Mount EFS, I've got my miscellaneous data folder in there. And so when we're done copying, our data will end up in there. And it should only be the JPEG files that we wanted. OK. So with that, uh, let's see. We're going to go to, oh, I need to hit Start. Start my task. And transfer over to Paul. So just like we've worked with S3, we've worked with our team in EFS. Now, for anybody that uses EFS file systems, you know that EFS has a little bit of a different access pattern. I don't access it with an IAM through a, a, a bucket endpoint or, or an access point. Um, I access it by mounting it inside one of your subnets. So we do that by creating ENIs, service managed ENIs, in a subnet that you configure. Um, it was under an advanced setting. We default everything in the console. There was an advanced twisty there for anybody that was eagle-eyed and watching. You can go and look and see which subnet we're choosing um, and which security groups we're using. You can set those to whatever you'd like. We choose suitable defaults for you. Again, we want it to be simple. We want you not to have to think about this. We create those ENIs in your, um, in your subnet, and then we mount your file system from the backend service. Um, we mount, do four mounts, just uh, again to try and get additional throughput, um, and um, again, that's going to be in your, in your subnet. Um, worth considering here that, again, EFS has two performance modes for their file system, GP, general purpose, and max IO. Um, GP comes with some file IOPS limits, so if you have small file workloads, you're going to, your transfer rate, and I think um, somebody mentioned it earlier, uh, Jeff mentioned it earlier, your transfer rate is going to be dominated by the ability to do file system operations as opposed to move data across the network. So for GP file system where you have that 7K FIOPS limit, that's likely to be your dominant speed at which you can move data rather than the speed of your network. For larger files, obviously, um, where we can get, uh, where that doesn't become the limit and I can now start to saturate your network, then you can start to get this sort of 10 gig type performance that um, we mentioned earlier. Um, again, for anybody that's provision, for, that's throughput limited because of EFS's throughput model, Again, consider turning on EFS provision throughput as a way of getting throughput into or out of your file system in order to get that maximum speed of movement between, um, between uh, your on-prem filer and your EFS file system. Um, Jeff did an example of includes and excludes, so let's, let's kind of look at those in a little more detail. Um, excludes are for files you never want to transfer. So in that instance, there's a snapshot folder, those temporary files, maybe operating system files, just stuff you never want to move, to, m never want the service to take care of. You configure those at a task level. Um, so in this instance, don't transfer snapshots. And again, I give you an example of the command line for how you'd specify that filter when you're setting up the task. Includes you specify each time you want to run the task. So when I create the task, I say never transfer these things. Every time I execute it, I say transfer these things now, which just allows you to target either specific files or specific folders. Again, it's a regex that you're specifying. So if you want to transfer a handful of files, you could specify all of those as an include each time you start the task. Or you can specify a folder and we'll recurse down the, the hierarchy from there. So in this instance, let's transfer everything under today's file and similar syntax here. If you're using the command line when you start the task, you just specify the include filter on the task. And again, the exclude filter still sort of prevails over the top of all this. And the include just allows you to transfer a subset of the files. 
Okay. So let's check this, the status of our task. So look at the execution details. Again, we ran successfully. Uh, you can see this time we only did 22 files. Again, that was just those JPEG files that we wanted to transfer. If I jump over here and I do an LS on uh, miscellaneous data folder, you can see that I've only got the JPEG files. So it didn't transfer those .temp files. It didn't transfer the .snapshot directory. Again, we hope you see that it's super easy to get data sync set up and running to, to copy your files. Um, and then with that, I think we're ready to turn it over to Maya. Yeah. All yours. Oh, boy. <laughs> Hi, reInvent. How are you guys doing? Keeping it? Yeah, okay. I feel like you're with me. Uh, so I'm Maya, and I'm here. I'm an Imagineer from Walt Disney Imagineering. Going to share with you the role uh, DataSync had in one of our recent projects. And in case you're uh, not super familiar with Imagineering, I brought along a little clip of what we've been up to recently. When we dream up new ideas for Disneyland, they first take shape and form in preliminary studies. The scale models and the drawings and the blueprint. These are the things that dreams are made of. seen it like 50 times rehearsing this talk and every time I get like legitimately excited uh, it's really it changes your your perceptions about what's possible um, just working in an environment like that so uh, let's get to know each other a little bit uh, I am kind of new to systems engineering this is my first reinvent so I'm super excited to be amongst all of you and attend all of your talks and sessions um, Super exciting, and uh, I'm here representing on behalf of my team, the WDI Infrastructure Group, um, and, a, and a lot of others who contributed to this project. Uh, I especially want to embarrass David Green, he's in the back. Uh, he's one of our Amazon colleagues, and it was his idea to invite us to share this story. Um, he, he possibly believes in me more than my own parents, so. Um, <laughs> And also, if you read ahead and you're a Dr. Mario player, uh, please see me afterward, because I have a little side quest, just a personal plug. I'm trying to find someone who can beat me. Um, so if you think that's you at reInvent, uh, definitely come talk to me. Or we can talk about data sync either way. Totally fine. Um, so let's get it. We were migrating our disaster recovery uh, copy to the cloud for this project. And you've probably seen something like this, and maybe it's why you're in this talk. Um, we were running out of capacity, and the conversations you're all having are like, hey, um, are we gonna add another node to this cluster? Are we gonna be able to add nodes fast enough as life continues on? Um, and we, we got to the point in the conversation where we decided, hey, this is a good time to move this data set to the cloud. Uh, more flexible, more scalable all the things you're all talking about all week. Um, for us, one problem though, we were dealing with 1.6 petabytes, which is more 1.6 of anything than I'm 
really able to scope in my mind. I just can't think logarithmically that big. It's enormous. So obviously this presents a little bit of an accounting challenge, uh, keeping track of you know what's on-prem and what's, what's in the cloud. Um, so to illustrate this, let's talk about huge numbers just for one second. Uh, at Imagineering, we spend a lot of time uh, framing our conversations around our guests and getting them on rides. So let's pretend that reInvent is a theme park. And last year, I'm told, there was something like 43,000 guests. So if all 43,000 guests wanted to take a ride on the WDI data sync, we could have synced you all 26 billion times, <laughs> which is enormous. Uh, this, the point here is this is quite a lot of bytes to keep track of in an organized fashion. Uh, not to mention, there's differences in the file system around volumes, not all bytes are created equally. Some of these, some sections that have the same amount of data are millions more files than other sections. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a challenge there. So how the heck did we get this thing done? Our pipeline consisted of three main pieces, uh, Axiom, GitLab, and Terraform. Uh, particularly want to shout out our SRE team for Axiom. This is our internal cloud automation tool that really propelled the whole project. Um, these guys are the best. So here's what it looked like. We had our NFS on-prem talking to multiple agents. And we played around a little bit with kind of our implementation of those agents, different hardware, different um, network and such uh, to get this thing dialed in appropriately for the size of the tasks at hand. Um, and our agents and our data sync had all of the resources declared in Terraform. So Terraform was declaring our agents, our NFS locations and our destination locations um, in S3 as well as all of the task creation. And then once those objects hit the bucket, we were life cycling them initially. And it was a cute little conversation that came up. We were like, hey, you know what would be great is if there was a way to put these directly into other storage classes. And so that conversation was had when we started this project. And I'm happy to, happy to see that that is now a reality. Um, and then once our life cycle policy was run, uh, we were moving objects to Amazon Glacier Deep Archive after 24 hours. So I kind of alluded to uh, one of our core challenges, which was the millions of files limit. So for uh, the task creation, there's a, there's a soft limit of 20 uh, million files per task. And we had many a task that were more than 20 million files. Uh, we initially wanted to break this down at the top level of our file system and just have very few tasks. Uh, but it became clear that we were going to need to pivot and create uh, tasks for a lot of volumes in order to make sure we, we met that requirement. Uh, and my colleague Adam actually came up with some super cool Terraform looping uh, to basically create a task out of every volume at a sub-layer of our tree and also matching S3 and NFS source and destination locations for the tasks uh, in DataSync. So it ended up being over 170 tasks that we we're able to create. Oh, great. Uh, in the final analysis, we ended up tuning this thing to have two agents on one 10 gig connection, moving about 40 terabytes a day, which uh, was pretty efficient for what we were, we were trying to get done. And for me, who was completely new to the cloud space, this was like mind blowing. I would drop decimals in conversations. I'd be like, I think we moved 40 gigs last night. And then I'd look at it again. No, that was 40 terabytes. Uh, it's wild to think about. Um, so I, I definitely mentioned I, I am new to reInvent. This is actually my first ever cloud project, my first ever AWS project, my first ever Terraform project. Um, and so maybe this is your first data sync. Maybe this is your first reInvent, uh, maybe this is just your next impossible, maybe you're gonna data sync many, many more petabytes. I hope this encourages you uh, to go for it. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll close it out. If you need to move data to the cloud, 
for processing, for archival, you want to stop spending more money on buying more on-prem storage, then you've just sat through the right session. Hopefully we gave you a taste for what the service is, what it does, how customers are using it, and how you could take it away and go do it yourself when you get home. As you saw, it's pretty easy to deploy an agent, configure your storage locations, and start moving your data. My name's Paul Reed. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, we'll take Q&A, and we do have stickers.